He is Lord. He is Lord. Christ has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, come let us adore him Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Cry, Christ the Lord. God bless you, beloveds. This is Bishop Anderson, New Shallow Holy Hands, Healing Ministry, Morning Glory Worship Service, saying that he is Lord. Realizing that we have about nine more days before Easter, which represents the resurrection of Christ, not so much bunny rabbits, but it's springtime, and he is Lord, talking about Jesus, because he's risen from the dead. Amen. Next week, I believe, next couple of weeks, we're going to have Passion Weeks, a celebration, the, uh, the suffering of Christ um, before he went before the pilots to be crucified. So we just truly thank God that he has risen over 2,000 years ago from the dead. And he's risen in our hearts and our souls today. And we just truly give honor to God who is first and foremost in my life and to my wife, Pastor Anderson, and to the live streaming audience. We thank God for Jesus. He is the hope of salvation. And we just truly thank him for his great grace that he's given unto us, that he has given freely unto us, that Jesus should suffer outside of the city of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem. He bled and he died for my sins, and not only for my sins, but for the sins of the world, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And like my uncle Randolph, Elvin Randolph, who went home to be with the Lord, used to all the time sing this song, Everlasting Life is Free. And I'm so glad that Jesus, he gave it to me, because everlasting life, beloveds, is free. We truly have a word that we want to share with you today from the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, in the, in the first verse. On last week, we, we preached on the hidden treasures that God has placed in our spirits, in our hearts, in our soul. And that hidden treasure, be, beloved, is the grace of God. His grace is God's unearned favor. We didn't do nothing to deserve it. We didn't earn it. And we can't do nothing to, re, to pay God for it because Jesus paid it all. Let us bow our hearts in a word of prayer before we go into the word on this morning. Father in heaven, we come before thy throne. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word with the live stream with the audience. And Lord, we ask you to bless your word. Bless me, your servant, who will attempt to give you that which you've placed in my heart today. Bless us, and we'll be ever so careful and glad to praise your name. Down the hand of the enemy that will hinder your word from going out. You say your word will go out. It will not return until you void, but it will accomplish that which you have sent it out to do today. Lord, we ask these and all the blessings. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a couple of weeks, as, um, as I foresaid, we'll be celebrating the, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But God has laid on my heart the book of Ephesians. We had talked about spirit, we talked about spiritual warfare and how the church and people need to stop fighting one another and fight the real enemy. 
which is the, the real enemy, which is the devil, Lucifer himself. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high place. But what attracted my attention in the book of Ephesians that, Charles, that Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus was the, the first verse. And it reads like this, Ephesians 6 and 1, King James Version. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because it's right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because it's right. Before Paul even gets to the church, the, uh, the warfare of the church, he starts off with the children of the kingdom. And that's very significant in so much that when the children had came to Jesus so that he could pray for them, and the disciples rebuked the children. And Jesus said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, because such is the kingdom of heaven. Then he tells us also in this word that except we humble ourselves as a little child, we can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, when I read this sixth chapter of Ephesians, the first verse, I glean spiritual and natural thoughts from it. Because the word of God is always a two-edged sword. It has the front cover and the back cover. And everything else is in between. Realizing Jesus is the author and he's the finisher of our faith. Children are important in the eyesight of God. Matter of fact, the angels of God represent each and every child that is born. Even though this system that we live in today will abort a fetus, will abort a child, will cheat a child like they're insignificant. But the angels of God stand before the presence of God to represent each and every child that's born into this world. In Psalms, the 27th chapter, in the 10th verse, the 21st, the 27th division of Psalm, the, the divisions written by different authors. In the 10th verse, it says this, When my father and my mother, when they forsake me, and they will basically forsake us all. And when I say forsake us all, one day our parents are going to die. Then the Lord will, he'll take you up. And I can relate so vividly to that portion of scripture. When your father and your mother forsake you, then the Lord would take you up. I have the privilege of yet having my natural biological mother. She's still alive, Pastor Mary Anderson, still a pastor. She'll be 84 in May, still going, as, going around as she's 50 or 64. <laughs> But even though we had, even though my family had a man in the house, a father in the house, my father never really fathered me. It was when God saved my soul that he taught me how to be a man. When I say they, he didn't father me, in other words, he wasn't a good example in some areas, just like most fathers are. We got good and we have bad. You know, we have good characteristics and we have bad characteristics. There's flaws most of the time that we got from our parents that were before us. Same thing here. But God taught me how to be a father. I may not be the best father, but I'm doing the best that I know how to do. Because most, most of the time we need some type of role model in order to exhibit how we ought to be as a, as a parent. The people oftentimes said that, you know, they didn't write no book for for parenting, which is not true. God gave us his word. If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And the Bible also teaches us to train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they get old, they won't depart from it. So the Bible is our instruction. B-I-B-L-E, basic, basic instruction before leaving earth. So God has already given us the outline for how to raise our children. So because my father wasn't a father, he was my dad, my biological father, and I love him. 
And I've learned a lot of things from him, good and bad. But the streets became my father. But the streets was basically destroying me. Because basically those that were in the streets, gang worn and doing whatever they were doing, didn't have a father figure in their life. The father figure in their life basically was their mother. And I oftentimes say this, a woman cannot tell you or, or teach you how to be a man if she's a woman. She can tell you how a man's supposed to be, how a man should treat a woman, so forth and so on. But you need a man for your example. This is why when we pray, what do we pray? We don't say, Abba, Abba Mama. We say, Abba Father, which are in heaven. Holy is your name. So the psalmist says, there's going to come a time where your parents are going to forsake you. But the good news of our beloved is, is that God will take you up. And God took me up. My wife lost her mother probably over when she was 25 years of age, over 50, probably 50 years ago, something like that or 40 something years ago. But she has spiritual parents in her life. This is why that scripture says, beloveds, children ought to obey their parents in the Lord. That's spiritual because my dad wasn't spiritual. My dad wasn't saved. My mom wasn't saved. But when God saved me, he gave me spiritual parents. And one of my spiritual parents was our Lockwood. She was my spiritual mother, even though cause my mother got saved in 73. But at the same time, talking, she was still a babe in Christ. But she was a great biological mother, even though she wasn't saved. So when I look at the book of Ephesians, I look at three things. I look at accountability. A child has an accountability to the person that's training them, that teaching them, that's feeding them spiritual food. Then the Bible says, for it's the right thing. It's the right thing to do, to obey, to be obedient, because obedience to your spiritual parents. And we have spiritual children that's out there today that got saved in our ministry. And they were able to hold on because they were able to obey the teaching, the foundation that God has placed in their lives. Now, as you build a house, you have, you have to have a good and solid foundation. But every, every level of that house, regardless how big that house is being built, has different configurations. But the foundation of God stands is sure that the Lord knows those that are his. Then it goes on to say, now God deals with the natural parents. He says, honor, Ephesians 6 and 2, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of God. It's the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments, but it's the first commandment of God that gives a promise. And what is that promise? I'm glad you asked that question. That God will extend and give you long life. When you honor your parents. So that's the child's responsibility. My accountability, our accountability as children natural, naturally and spiritually is to honor those that God has placed over our lives. This is the first commandment with promise. What is the promise? That it may be well with thee. I honor my mother to this day. You know, we may not always see eye to eye. But that's the woman that brought me into this life. My dad had passed over 20 years ago, but we honored him, even though in my eyesight, he could have been a better, a better father. Someone who to, to nurture and to father you, not someone just to put a, a roof over your head and clothes on your back, which I'm grateful for, because he was there. Food on your table. So the Bible says, I don't care whether they're a crackhead. Whether they are a uh, uh, um, abuser of their of, of their family, I still need God saying I still want you to honor them. And He said when you honor that person that you may not feel is up to standard as a parent in your life because you're looking at other people's families, 
and how their fathers is going to the baseball game, the basketball games, you know, going on cookouts and doing things with their children, going on family vacations. Basically, I don't remember that with my pat, with my father. But I remember some of the good times we were able to go to Lake Island or Smith Playground. But when I became a father, we took trips with our family, with my children. So, but the Bible is basically telling you to honor them, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. That's your responsibility as a child. And when you honor them, God said, I give you long life. And when you dishonor your parents, whether spiritually or naturally, and I often told my church this when we were pastoring in Philadelphia, you can't tell your story without me. And I can't tell my story without you. You got here somehow. And a lot of times we forget the bridges that brought us over. And we have spiritual children out there that yet keep in contact with us to this day because of the foundation that the Lord has allowed us to establish in their life. So Paul tells the children to obey their tra- children because it's the right thing to do. Children ought to honor their parents so that you can live long upon the earth that the Lord, what the Lord has given them. Then he goes on to tell the fathers, these are the areas that we're going to be covering, as far as accountability to our parents. Children have accountability. Then he tells the father, you're accountable too. He told the father, don't provoke your children to wrath. You can't go around getting your children making your children mad just because you're in charge, just because you're the dad. Do it because I say do it. A good father is going to explain to that child why I do the things that I do, because eventually you're going to fill my shoe spiritually and naturally. When you have spiritual children, you have to do the same thing, because you're not going to always be around. Eventually, God's going to bless them in ministry to grow and to expand. And that's what Jesus said. He wants you to have fruit. He wants you to have fruit to remain. That's the fathering process. So the father has the responsibility to not provoke the children to wrath. Then your other responsibility as a father, before we go further into this text, your responsibility as a father naturally and spiritually is to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Then he goes on so telling you that the process of responsibility, accountability, and, and the, the hierarchy of how things work. He told the servants to obey your masters in the Lord. Now, to make it more applicable to the 21st century, when you go to the job, you're working as unto the Lord. You don't work with our service just to please man. Because there's always an all-seeing eye that's watching you. And we have been taught that whatever you do for Christ, that's what's going to last, beloved. So even on your job, you ought not to be stealing just because nobody sees you. They had to put cameras on the, on, on the job to keep an eye on you. But when you're doing service unto the Lord, you're not going to steal because you see that God is not pleased with that. And that there's an all-seeing eye watching you. So servants obey their masters as doing service unto God. Whatever I do, I do it to the glory and honor of God. Whatever, as far as an employer, as a servant, whatever you want to call it, a student, a disciple, a follower, a learner, and a precept keeper, we're doing services unto God. We represent God. I thank God that the job that the Lord had given me in my life, from working from sweeping streets to cutting ditches to driving trucks to supervising men to fighting fires to being in prison or working with the inmates, everywhere God has blessed me to be, it was always unto him. My, my Heavenly Father taught me that I represent the kingdom of God wherever you go. And when people speak evil of you, the Bible said, let it be a lie. Then he goes on to say, Master, be good to your employees. Be good to your servants. Why? I'm talking about Master. My wife and I were studying this morning, the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Jesus, they called Jesus a master, a rabbi, your boss, the person that's 
that's over you, authority, the, the hierarchy. He said, you want to be good to your servants, to the people that's working for you, because you have a master. God is the ultimate authority. This is promotion don't come from the north, south, or west. Promotion comes from the Lord. So even when God places you in position of authority, you yet have a responsibility, accountability unto God. From the children to the parents, from the parent to the children, from the servant to the boss or to the master. Then he goes on to say to the church. He tells the church to put on the whole arm of God. Letting them know that the fight that the church have is a spiritual fight and that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power against the rulers of darkness of this world. So Paul is basically breaking down to us accountability, responsibility in the hierarchy of how things work as far as for spiritually and naturally. Principalities and powers are basically what we're going through, what we're fighting against as far as the church. Then Paul says this. He says, I am a, I'm a, a, an ambassador for Christ. In other words, I represent God. And that's what we are, beloved. We are ambassadors for Jesus. An ambassador basically don't have his own opinion. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. Christ in me. The hope of eternal glory. So an ambassador represents the president. You can't say your own words. You can be eloquent in how you say it, but basically the message that you give to the foreign country is the message that the president gave to you to give. Jesus said, I always do the things that are pleasing to my father. I speak not my own words, but I speak the words that God has given me. And Paul said, I'm an ambassador for Christ so that I can reveal unto, uh, unto you the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And because I can't be here today with you, I'm going to say try Christ unto you so that he can comfort your heart and share the same gospel to you. Now, I don't claim to understand why Paul starts this chapter of Ephesians, starting with the children, but I see this, this section of this book, the sixth chapter, it's like a warning to us, to the church. You have responsibility, you have accountability. And I could be wrong. And you have a, a hierarchy over you. Even in the spiritual world, it's a hierarchy. You know, you have Gabriel, you have Michael. These angels was mentioned in the Bible. They had position. They had authority. Michael had the authority to kick Lucifer out of heaven. Gabriel had the authority to tell Mary, thou shalt bring forth a child. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. She, he had the authority to tell Mary what you're going to name your child. And then she, he told Mary what his purpose in life was going to be. Thou shalt bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. A hierarchy. Even Lucifer, he's over, he was over his angels. One third of the he angels of heaven got kicked out of heaven because they believed the lies of Donald Trump. I mean Lucifer. <laughs> so, 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 so as we go on, beloved, he mentioned that he's an ambassador and that he had the responsibility to convey the, the word of God to the church of Ephesians. Even in the world, beloved, there's a hierarchy. You have the three parts of government. The judicial, the the law. You have the president, the the uh, the president position. Parents have their authority over their children. Master have their authority over their servants, and principality have this authority over spiritual wickedness. So we must all give an account. That's the bottom line that I want to bring out today. And the only way to fight the spiritual battle is by putting on. The, helmet, the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, to keep your mind stayed on him. For they that keep their mind stayed on, Lord, on the Lord, he will keep them in perfect peace.
the breastfeed of righteousness. We need to guard our hearts because out of it comes the issues of life. What's ever in the heart is going to come out. So this is why you have to be careful what you place, what you allow to come into your heart. Guard it, beloved. Have your lines worked about with truth. That's what we represent. Your lungs is your strength part of your of your gut area. That's where your strength you gather your strength from, and that should be established on truth and not lies. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace is a fall of peace with all men, and holiness without no man shall see the Lord. So children obey your parents in the Lord because it's the right thing to do. In Matthew's eighteen and ten, talking about the importance of children, going back to my first point. Jesus said this. He said, take heed, spiritually and naturally, as we speak to you today. Continue to keep that two-edged sword out. Continue to remember that there's a beginning and the end to the book that we're speaking. He said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, that the angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So we have to be, be careful that we don't offend our natural children and our spiritual children as parents. In Matthew 19 and 13, then were they brought unto him children, we mentioned earlier, so that Jesus could bless them. But the disciples, the church, rebuke them. Children ought to have a place in the house of God. If you have a church that don't have children in the house of God, that's being trained and nurtured, you have a church that's dying. You have a church that is dying because eventually those people that are in your church, they're going to get old and they're going to fade away. They're going to die there. So we have to have children. So the Bible says that the disciples re re rebuked them. So you ought to have a youth ministry, a youth pastor, someone that can relate to the children. The youth pastor, talking about the, the hierarchy, is responsible for taking care of the children, but they're responsible to answer to the elders that's in the church. They rebuke the children. Then Jesus said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Allow them to come. Allow them to be a part of your ministry. When you think about the ministry of Christ, when he fed the 5,000 hungry souls, men plus women and children, he didn't just speak the word and bread came. He could have. But he asked, how are we going to feed so, much, so many people? Philip says, we have a child here with two fish and five loaves of bread. That miracle was taking place because of child. God uses children. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, I can't speak, I'm only a child. The, the book of Jeremiah, first chapter, his, God said, I'll say you're only a child. Before, I, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, little child. And I ordained you before you were even formed to be a prophet to the nation. In Luke 17, it tells you that it's better to have a millstone hung about your neck than for you to offend one of God's little children and for you to be cast into the sea than to offend God's children. And ch children are a blessing from God, beloved. And we kill millions of them every year, spiritually and naturally. You don't know what you're saying. I see how I say this. A child ought to be seen and not heard. Don't you know it was a, it was a child that was named Samuel that God spoke to when he, did, when he stopped speaking to Eli the prophet? It was a child that God used. He didn't recognize the voice. That's why the Bible said, train them. Train up a child to recognize who God is, to recognize his voice. For Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And a stranger that will not obey. He told Peter to feed my sheep and feed my lamb. What do you think a lamb is? A lamb is a babe. 
a child. I knew you. This is why that first commandment, beloved, is so important. Children, obey your parents. Be obedient to your parents, naturally and spiritually. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. So Jeremiah felt, he felt like he wasn't qualified to be a prophet to the nation. What qualified Jeremiah was God. That's your qualification. And when I think about that, God is your qualification. He's your validation. When I think about that, I think about all the children that could have been born, that was aborted, and you don't know, you you don't even know why they what their purpose was in the world. You say, why you say that, bitch? Because I think about Moses. Pharaoh said, kill them all, kill all the boys, kill all the, 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 the male children, kill them, abort them. I don't need no challenge, I don't need nobody questioning my authority, I don't need it. The midwives, Pharaoh said, why are you not obeying me? The Hebrew women, they, they pop them out like, rab like rabbits. Before you know it, the, the child is born. It was a child that God used, beloved. You don't know your purpose in life. My age, I used to be a juvenile delinquent. I'm probably an adult delinquent now. But um, my age used to always say that Frankie, that's what, that's what they used to call me. That's my middle name, Franklin. He's a good boy. When I was a bad boy staying in trouble as a juvenile delinquent, she said, Frankie's a good boy. Maybe God gave me the revelation of my purpose in life that I would. But even even in that, beloved, so all we were just saying, he's not all bad. There's some good in him. Mm -hmm. You know, give him a chance and he'll mature. He'll come around. Paul said, when I was a child, <laughs> I act like a child. And when I became a man, I put away childish thing. When I became spiritually mature, I put away childish thing. Going back to Moses. Pharaoh didn't want that to happen. Principality, spiritual wickedness in high places, realizing that God is eventually going to send somebody here to deliver these people out of bondage because the masters are being bad to the servants. And God had Moses in the plan. Now, Moses, he was a Hebrew, but he was also a murderer, he was a convict. He was a convict that was on the run because he killed the Egyptian because the Egyptian was treating his servant real bad. And he had to flee for 40 years. He was a felon. He had a warrant for his arrest. But Moses wasn't all bad because God had a purpose for that little child that was drawn from the Nile River. God had a purpose for every child that is born. I think about the song saying, with a child's heart. That's what we need. In order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, we have to have a child's heart. What is a child's heart? It's a heart of innocence. It's a heart that's easy, easy to forgive. It's a heart that's easy, easy to get offended also, but it's a heart that's a forgiving heart. And we need that same kind of heart. John said in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he called us little children. We are Children in the eyesight of the Lord. So Moses' purpose wasn't to be locked up, to be killed by Pharaoh, or to be an ex-con all his life. But God had a purpose for Moses as a child to deliver the children of Israel of bondage. And this what this what really touched my heart about the life of Moses. When the parents of Moses seen that he was a goodly child, they hid him for three months until they couldn't hide him no more. But God had a plan for each and every child that's been hid. Are you hidden in the house? Don't be discouraged. Don't think it's all over. God has a purpose for you. Jeremiah 29 11 said, God said, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to your expected end. And you shall find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. 
It's all you had to do. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and God will abundantly pardon. Don't say I'm only a child. Don't say that God can't use me. Children are an inheritance of the Lord. Lord, make me to be humble as a little child so that I can enter into the kingdom of heaven. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's the process. And that's what I learned from my spiritual mother, Ella Lockwood. You have to, it's being born. Just like in the natural, when is life conceived? But you're yet being born, even though you may still be in the womb, like God told Jeremiah. You're being born. The being is a process, beloved. It takes nine months for a woman to basically have a child, to bring forth a child. But we're being born again. And what happened with the church is that we don't give a person the opportunity to be. If you say you're born again, you're born again. And I'm going to give you meat instead of milk. We're not patient with the being born is that you're going to make mistakes. And matter of fact, beloved, you learn from your mistakes. He told Nicodemus, even though you're a religious leader, you don't understand the things of the kingdom of heaven because they are spiritually discerned. And he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So Nicodemus being ignorant of himself, saying, how can a man be born again when he is old? I'm already a man. Can I re-enter into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus let Nicodemus to know that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit. Being born is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Children are innocent, and this is the position of a child. Innocent, easy to learn, easy to be entreated. And even the scripture tells us when you deal with an elder, you have to deal with an elder as a father. You ought to entreat that individual. I don't care if you're three times seven plus some. If you just got saved, you ought to honor your spiritual parents and entreat them as a father. Go to them with respect. And honor. Children will pay your parents in the Lord because it's the right thing to do. Honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long upon the earth with the Lord thy God has given thee to honor. Any great move of God, if you look in the Bible, always started with a child. Even though God, the word said David was a man after God's own heart. He was yet a child. He was yet a child. He was a child that took care of his father's sheep. And his father gave him assignment, the same assignment that God has given us to preach the word of God. He took his brother's bread. What are we giving you today? The bread of life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's a proceeding word. He obeyed his father, went down to the camp of Israel. He went into harm's way. He could have got killed. But God had an assignment for David. And his assignment was to take care of this problem. Goliath. A child. Any major move of God always start with a child. So we have to protect them. As uh, Jesus said, I would have brought you in Jerusalem as a mother hen takes care of her chicks. Mm -hmm. Put them under her wings in the time of the storm. But you would not come. Children are inheritors of the Lord. Blessed is the person that has a full quiver. Many children. It starts with a child. Matthews 11, 11. Jesus talked about John the Baptist being a child. When he was a child, God had a purpose for John the Baptist's life, for Zacharias and for Elizabeth. They were old. So God had them in order to teach John the Baptist. Jesus even, even talked about John the Baptist. Matthew 11, 11, he said, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of a woman, then not has risen a greater 
than John the Baptist. He said, notwithstanding, mm -hmm. he that is least in the kingdom right. of heaven is greater than he. Talking about himself, I'm greater than him. But the greatest one of all the children that was born beside myself was John the Baptist. It always starts with children. We ought to protect them with, our, with everything that's within us. To nurture, to, to, to guide them, to instruct them, and sometimes we have to rebuke them and chase them. And God tells us in his word, any child that he loved, and he loved us all, he chasing us. And if you cannot endure chastisement, which is instruction, correction, he said you become a bastard and not a son. Jesus was a child. As I first said, the angel Gabriel told Mary what type of child that he would be. <laughs> We're in the government shall be upon his shoulder, upon the shoulder of a child. How he would be a, a, a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Look at Jesus at 12 years old, 12 years of age, talking to the doctors and lawyers. For three days, his parents didn't know where he was at because thought he was with the rest of the family. They had to backtrack to find Jesus at the age of 12. That's the only place in Scripture where the Lord tells us the early life of Christ Jesus. I mean, you may read the Aquarian Gospel and the other books, but in the King James Version, that's the only one. And when they found Jesus, he was with the doctors and lawyers. They could not... Compete with the wisdom and the knowledge that this young child had because he was full of, of the, God gave him the spirit of God without measure. Without measure, beloved. So the parents asked him, why did you leave us? We were looking for you for three days. It's always in the three days that God deal with it. If you fast for three days, look for the fourth day for that blessing. Because it was already there, but the enemy would try to hinder your blessing from coming. He said, didn't you know, didn't you know, that my purpose in life is greater than this? But I must be about, I must be about, at the age of 12, mm -hmm. not about playing baseball, football, basketball, but I must be about my father's business. Not Joseph. He's my surrogate father, but my heavenly father's business. I must be about his business. Right. I must do the will of him who sent me. Talking about being a child. This is why obedience is better than sacrifice. He said, I got to obey my father. And it was appointed unto me to talk to these doctors and lawyers. To let them know that all power and all knowledge come from God. And not from man. Because evidently Joseph didn't teach him that. Maybe he told him how to do carpentry. But he didn't tell him how to confound with doctors and lawyers. Didn't you know I must be about my father's business. You never know the potential of the child that you're birthing into this life. Right. Biological parents and spiritual parents, you never know what God is bringing through you. And even with, with, with me, with my natural son, my youngest son, Brian, he all the time try to mirror his life to mine. Uh, 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 I don't know why he want to do that, but <laughs> I feel honored by it. He's honoring me because he called me dad, so I honor that. But I always want him to supersede that which I have done in this life. But it's not about the material things with me, because every good and perfect gift comes from the above. Whatever I have, God gave me. And he gave it to me because I was kind of faithful to him. I was trying to kind of obedient to my spiritual parents, to my natural parents. Once God saved me <laughs> mm -hmm. from that miserable, <laughs> that miserable life of sin, sin was miserable. Got tired of being a sinner. You need to get tired of being sinful.
you know, not that we're not that we're perfect today, but you gotta get sick and tired of being sick and tired, doing the same thing over and over again, no change in your life. But the greatest gift that my sons, whether it's Ricky, Frankie, Brian, or my spiritual sons, could ever have is if they Paul said, Follow me as I follow Christ. Because that's who I'm following. If you want to have the same type of uh, blessings that I have, God has blessed me with, follow Christ. Because every good and perfect gift came from a gut bar. And God blesses me because I try to be obedient to his word. I'm not perfect. As I foresaid earlier in my disclosure, no parent is perfect. We make mistakes. But that's why it's good to have more children. Because <laughs> a lot of times you're going to make a mistake on your first one, whether it's spiritual or natural. You're going to make all your mistakes. And when you have your second and third one, or fourth or fifth one, or sixteenth one, you're going to get better and better at being a parent. So what, so my point is, beloved, is, is that we ought to protect the inheritance that God has given us, which is children. And Paul started off with children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then he said to the children, honor thy father and mother, that their days may be long upon the earth. In Second Kings 22 and 1, it was a king by the name of Josiah. He was a king for 30 years, but he became a king when he was eight years of age, a king at the age of eight, running a nation because God was with him. Why was God with him? I'm going to read it. Josiah was eight years of old, Second Kings 22 and 1, when he began to reign. So you don't think I'm making these words up myself. It's in the book. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of An Adiah of Bukath. The second verse. And he did that which was right of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of David, his father, for David was a man after God's own heart. And he turned out aside to the right or to the left. Even though he was king, he realized that he had a greater king over his life. And that king had to reign in the throne of your heart, beloveds. I'm the head of my family. <laughs> my wife is the neck. Anything with two heads, they say is a freak. But... My neck needs my head, but my crown of glory is my father, which is in heaven. He's the head of my family. And the only reason my family works, my household works, my wife and I will be married 48 years on Valentine's Day next year, is because he rules over this house. He rules over me. Talk about the, the hierarchy, the children, the wife. The man, Christ, God. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is a message that can revolutionize your life if you be obedient to the word of God. Just like Josiah was at the age of eight. How can an eight-year-old rule the kingdom? Because he had people around him that feared God. Hallelujah. He did that which, which was right in the sight of God. Tear down those groves. Tear down the idol gods, them idol worshippers, them idol gods in your life. He followed the example of David, his father, which was a man after God's own heart, beloved. So children are inheritance from the Lord, beloved. The word teaches us to obey them that have rule over us. Why should I be obedient to my spiritual parents? I, I'm glad you asked that question. Hebrews 13 and 7, 17 said that obey them that have rule over you and submit yourself. Submit yourself to them. For they 
watch for your body. The Bible doesn't say that. Hebrews 13 and 17 it doesn't say they watch for your body. They watch for your soul. They see what you don't see. They don't they see the spiritual forces that comes against you. They watch for your soul. Not only are we watching on the walls, and it says, and they must give an account. I have to give an account. My wife has to give an account. We have to give an account for you. Our spiritual children, our natural children. Talked about accountability, responsibility, and the hierarchy of authority that God gives us as pastors, as leaders, as parents. We have a responsibility that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. When you act like you don't have no parents, whether it's natural or spiritual, he says right here, it brings grief to the parents and it's unprofitable for you. I don't care whether you three times seven plus some. As a matter of fact, most of our spiritual children that's out there that's pastor in the day. Let me tell you something. Their foundation that they have in their life stands ashore because we kept them in New Debon Valley Valley. We taught them the word of God. And if they strayed from it because they thought it was better, the grass was greener on the other side, most of them really came right back to home base. They said that which our spiritual parents has taught us was right. Prayer, the power of prayer, the power of consecration, the power of living a holy life, the power of being obedient to God's holy word. As we come to our close, the word let us to know, beloved, as I foresaid earlier, we ought not to rebuke an elder. It said, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger as brethren. Then he says, and the elder women <laughs> as mothers, the younger sisters with all purity. This is the word of the Lord for us today, beloveds. We have much more that we could give you, but the point that we want to bring out today is we have accountability. We have responsibility as parents, as children. And there's a hierarchy that we have to live by. We have to submit ourselves to the authority of those that God has placed over our life, whether it be spiritually or naturally. I remind you of one of the children, one of the adults, adult that was in our ministry. <laughs> um they were always obedient, always obedient. But if they did not disagree, if they disagree with you, they wouldn't argue with you. They respectfully agree to disagree. And that's how you do it, beloved. You don't go around, you know, because I'm grown, I can do this, I can say whatever I want to say. You know, you don't have no filter in your life. You just say anything. The Bible says to test not my anointing and to do my prophet no harm. God set pastors up in the church for a reason, you know, to instruct, to, to give the children instruction. You say, I'm not a child no more. If, if you just got born again, you're a child as far as God is concerned. And Paul said this. He said, I can prove that you're a child because you're yet carnal. And he said, because you're a child, I couldn't give you meat. Not even to this point. Talked about it in Corinthians. And our brother could not speak to you. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1. I could not speak unto you as spiritual. But as unto carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ. You don't want to destroy a babe in Christ. And the reason he could not give them spiritual meat. Because you couldn't digest it. It would choke you. Jesus said this, except you eat my flesh and except you drink my blood, you have no life in you. The disciples, 
not the inner circle, not the 12, but the other 70, some say. They said, this a, it, the Bible said, many of his disciples said this. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And because they lack spiritual understanding, the Bible says that they walk with him. Talking about Jesus, they walk with Jesus no more. So Jesus asked his 12 the question, will you go also? And Peter gave him this word. Where shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. And that which we've given you today, beloveds, is basically basic instruction before leaving earth of the importance of a child. The next time we come together, beloveds, hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about the responsibilities of a parent. So let us bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Lord, where, where shall we go? Because thou hast the words of eternal life. They walk with him no more. Jesus said to his disciples, when you don't understand God's word, take time out to go before your spiritual parents and say, make it, make it, make it plain. I, I don't have a clue. Jesus said unto you, it's not given to them, but it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. To them it's not revealed. When people don't understand God's word, they get offended. It don't take all of that. It take all of that, beloveds, and more. God is a holy God, and he wants you to live a holy life. I don't care what nobody else says. This is the word of the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for it does the upright good in the heart. We ask you, God, just to bless those who have heard your word today. You have the words of eternal life. And, Lord, we ask you, God, just to help us to honor our parents naturally and spiritually because it's the right thing to do. They brought us here, Lord, even though you used them to bring us here. And we thank you for them today. Lord, save through your word, set free, heal, and deliver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a child... I acted as a child. But when I became spiritually mature, you begin to put away childish things. My, my, my mother, I'm, I'm done. But my mother often I say, you had never be grounder than me. Have you ever heard that before? You may be more educated than me. You may know how to work a computer and all the technology. But you had never be grounder than me. And that's true. And I say that to all my sons, spiritually and naturally. You'll never be growner than me. And when I see your growth, I respect your growth because I know that which I have imparted into your life is coming to fruition. This is Bishop Anderson, New Shallow Holy Hands Healing Ministry, morning worship, morning glory worship service, saying, God loves you. I love you. And there's nothing that you or anyone could do about it. Be blessed. Let the word of God penetrate your spirit, soul, and mind. In Jesus' name, have a great day. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen.